Welcome to Capital Thinking, Energy Insights for Today's Market, presented by Stevens and Locklord. Today's topic is oil field services and energy. The industry is at a turning point. We'll cover market sentiment given volatility in the sector, structural changes facing oil field services and energy, the impact of ESG, and the long-term outlook for the industry. Hello, I'm Paul Mormon, a Managing Director in the Energy Group at Stevens Investment Banking. Welcome to Capital Thinking, Energy Insights for Today's Market. This virtual thought leadership webinar series explores the challenges and opportunities affecting the energy industry. By way of background, Stevens has a long history of serving the space. The firm has been a principal investor in energy since 1952, and the Stevens Energy Investment Banking practice began in 2009. We have expertise in EMP, midstream, oil field service, or OFS, as well as alternative and renewable energy. As for myself, I've been with Stevens for seven years and have more than two decades of energy-related experience. For our second webinar topic, we are focusing on the various dynamics that have caused the oil field service sector to reach a turning point. Our discussion will dive into the volatility the sector has experienced over the last few years, structural changes that have affected everything from pricing to consolidation, how the rise of ESG and renewables is influencing fossil fuel investment decisions, and finally, the long-term outlook for oil field services in the U.S. My co-host is the one and only Joe Perillo, a partner in the Houston office of Lock Ord, one of the world's preeminent energy law firms. Joe Perillo has been named to the 2021 list of the best lawyers in America practicing corporate law. He has significant experience in energy, and has deep expertise working with public and private companies. Joe has worked on projects including M&A, joint ventures, security offerings, corporate restructurings, private equity, venture capital, and corporate governance. Joe, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for the introduction and glad to be here, Paul. Uh, this This is a topic that producers, industry participants, and consumers around around the world are quite passionate about. And I think going, we're going to have a great conversation with our expert panelists. Speaking of whom, now might be a good time to introduce them. With us today are Bobby Barrett, a managing director in energy at Angelo Gordon. Angelo Gordon, founded in 1988, is a privately held alternative investment firm operating across a broad range of credit and real estate strategies. Welcome, Bobby. Hi, Paul. Thank you for having me. Patrick Connolly is co-managing partner at Intervale Capital. Intervale Capital, founded in 2006, is a specialized private equity firm focusing on infrastructure, energy, and industrial end markets. Patrick, glad to have you today. Thank you, Paul, for having me. Very nice to be here with you. Also here today, Thomas Jacob, a vice president at Rystad Energy. Rystad Energy, founded in 2004, is an independent research and business intelligence company providing data, analytics, and consultancy services to clients with global exposure. Thomas, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Paul. I'm excited to be here, and thank you for having me on the panel. Wayne Richards, who is president and CEO of GR Energy Services. GR Energy Services is a completion and production solutions company committed to lowering oil and gas companies operational risk, and total cost of operations. Wayne, really happy to have you participate today. Paul, thank you very much uh, to you and Joe, and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Last but not least, Robert Trainer, who's president and CEO of Gyrodata. Gyrodata, founded in 1980, is a provider of technologies and differentiated services to the energy industry for maximizing hydrocarbon recovery and optimizing asset life cycle costs. Excited to have you here today, Robert. Paul, thanks for having me. I'm sure everyone is excited to hear what our panelists have to say. Joe, the floor is yours. Please get us started. I'd be happy to, Paul. So let's begin by addressing market volatility and investor sentiment. That applies to both the oil field services sector and the energy industry more broadly, especially given the upheaval over the last five years, which was particularly pronounced in early 2020. Uh, Paul, why don't you start with the first question? Great. Well, look, panelists, I'd love to get your view. You know, from where I sit, it appears that institutional capital has turned its back 
on additional energy sector investment. Is that how you see it? And how are you evaluating energy investment opportunities given the uncertainty and challenges in the sector? When you answer, feel free to note any areas of interest or strategies where your firm is focused. Bobby, maybe if I could turn it over to you to, to, to take a shot at that one first. Sure, Paul. Uh, I would say uh, quite simply that this is an unprecedented dislocation uh, in the capital markets uh, today for the oil field services industry. Certainly for, uh, one that I've never seen in, in my career. And I think this dislocation uh, goes across multiple, I should say all OFS sectors, forms of capital and any type of company from the OFS major straight down to the small uh, independents. Uh, in the credit markets, uh, you're seeing this dislocation, even with working capital facilities, more traditional uh, ABL, ABL lines, and you're also seeing that migrate uh, into the term loan market um, and into the high yield market. Markets that tip that are largely non-existent uh, for most oil field, uh, oil field service companies, even to the majors, uh, if they were to go out uh, and certainly try and raise um, additional capital. Uh, also, in the credit markets, alternative uh, credit investors, uh, particularly BDCs, are exiting uh, very rapidly. They have been for the last two to three years, but it's now been accelerated. Uh, it would be very uh, surprising to see them come back in any meaningful numbers uh, anytime soon. And those are the same investors who rapidly fueled uh, a lot of the growth um, between 11, uh, certainly in 15. Uh, I would say the overhang, both in terms of uh, working capital facilities and the term loan markets and the like, is the exodus of the commercial banks. You play an integral role, typically for a lot of these uh, large uh, industrial companies. Uh, in the equity markets, what we're seeing, certainly, obviously, the IPO market uh, is shut for oil field services and a lot of, and a lot of uh, operators, uh, a lot of uh, investors are wondering if that market will ever come back and if it does. Uh, certainly what will it look like. We're seeing oil field service focused PE funds. Uh, uh, they're being, uh, certainly they're being very careful. They're supporting existing investments, but when it comes to new investments, uh, if it is happening, it's happening in very certainly small, very selective uh, numbers. Uh, typically at this time uh, in our recovery, and I think we could all agree that we're starting to gradually uh, claw our way back. We would typically see in a recovery uh, non-energy PE funds start to dip their toe back uh, into oil field services. We're not seeing that. So it is this broad dislocation that has been uh, that has broken uh, from a lot of different trends that we're seeing, and this includes the recovery back in 15 and 16, uh, the recovery in 2010, and 2011, and we certainly can go back to even further where trends that we normally see in terms of capital being available to the oil field services sector is just not, uh, it's just not there. I would say from an Angela Gordon perspective, uh, I would say most importantly, uh, we're very actively uh, looking for new opportunities. We are open for business. We're oil and gas uh, investors. It's what we do. We're here for certainly uh, the long term, particularly for the oil field services sector. We don't go in and out and play the different cycles. Uh, so we are looking at opportunities, but certainly there are uh, uh, standards, credit underwriting standards that we are particularly focused on. Uh, and that includes both for onshore and off, for production and completion, for relating assets, drilling, upstream, midstream, downstream, you have it. We're looking at it, but there, uh, but there certainly is um, a bar that we're looking at uh, for oil field services. And I would say if there are some consistent themes, one is most importantly, these are defensible businesses uh, with high quality assets. That's not necessarily uh, the equipment out in the field. That is uh, the team, most importantly, that is managing those assets. Uh, we wanna see businesses that have access to not just one basin, but multiple basins where we uh, like to see, where we think that there is a good market uh, across all uh, specific subsectors. And then certainly uh, what is most important is, is that, the, that the team has a track record. Uh, there, we're always looking for competitive dif differentiations. Uh, it's hard to, to see it and look at, but I think when we're looking at things, we're looking at for that, for certainly that extra edge for a business that's not CapEx intensive. What are we thinking about? We're trying to fill the banks and the holes left by the banking market and the institutional market uh, for well services. And that could be 
uh, revolvers, that could be uh, term loans, that could be something in between. It certainly would be on a secure basis. Uh, and that's uh, something that helps grow the business because we are starting to now get in that point of the cycle where companies are gonna need working capital, they're gonna need uh, cash to replenish equipment. Uh, so we're trying to be creative. We're certainly trying to be supportive, but there is a definite bar given all this dislocation. Bobby, thanks for, for the insights. You know, really interesting. You mentioned private equity in your answer. You know, maybe Patrick, I can turn it over to you and pose the same question, you know, given given your your track record in, in private equity investment in, in, in oil field services specifically. Thanks, Paul. And I, I think, you know, Bobby nailed it, capital markets. Maybe what I'll do is just try to build on that from a private capital perspective. Certainly, there's been a very significant withdrawal of capital from the space. Uh, when we try to understand why, of course, it has everything to do with returns. Uh, the good news is, of course, that means it's a fixable problem. Returns need to come back. Uh, but capital has left the space. Fund formation on a private equity basis has uh, all but come to a trickle. And it's come pounded not just by the poor returns that a lot of institutional investors have seen, but also because of the very significant reweighting that's happened. When you work your way up to the providers of capital to PE firms, many of them find themselves today significantly overweight energy, not by virtue of investments they're making today, but by simply by virtue of investments they made during the growth phase, when the industry was a voracious consumer of capital. And as the broader markets have, have rebalanced, they've found themselves uh, you know, in a position where they haven't seen a lot of distributions from the space. Returns have not been good, and they uh, are trying to reweight themselves to align with water productive. So, you know, where do we think interesting opportunities are today? Uh, private equity capital tends to be a bit more expensive, and the addressable market, particularly oil field services space for private equity returns, I think has gotten smaller. It's difficult today to make those types of returns simply by adding capacity. So the question is, what are you going to be investing that does something new that the industry really truly values, that it thinks it needs to improve itself so that the industry as a whole can return, uh, improve returns for investors. So for a, a firm in the capital, uh, sorry, in the private equity markets today, we're really looking to deploy capital into those businesses that we think are gonna drive productivity improvements so that it in effect lowers the cost to produce from our, uh, most of our primary customers, which are the producers. Thanks Patrick, really interesting. And maybe to sort of round out the perspective, Robert, if, if you could answer the same question, you know, given you're more on the operations side, uh, company side of things, I think it would be interesting to hear hear how you view the world. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one that's seeing the world a particular way. And that's a tough act to follow Bobby and Patrick there. I think they pretty much summed it up. Um, I, I guess I would just add briefly that, you know, as an operator in the OFS sector, I can I can tell you that you know, simple things like a revolver, which which Bobby mentioned earlier, are um, I, I've been frankly shocked at how difficult it has been to, again, do simple things like renew a line of credit, um, you know, that's secured with with assets like receivables, um, with uh, banks that you know we've had multi decade decades long relationships with, um, and with a really clean balance sheet. So. It's um, it's exceptionally difficult. I can only imagine what you know many of my peers are going through um, that may not be perhaps as lucky as we are in terms of um, uh, balance sheet position. Um, so it's 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 phenomenally difficult. And so I would just I guess agree with everything that Bobby and Patrick just laid out. Thanks, Robert. Maybe to, to sort of hit on a, a sort of a similar topic, you know, in this market. You know, it's been my experience value, valuing a company, valuing an investment is, is becoming increasingly different, difficult. Um, you know, what's y'all's view in terms of how things, strategic initiatives in, in terms of sales or divestitures, whether it's a cash deal or stock deal, what, what are sort of the prominent methodologies being used in, in today's market? And Patrick, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll toss this one back to you again. Yeah, I don't mean to be too coy when I answer this, but perhaps the first thing we should say is congratulations to somebody who can get a transaction done at the bottom of the market, or at least a consensual transaction done. It's been a pretty tough market to get uh, new deals done, not just because of the challenges with COVID and wanting to get to know an asset, but frankly, valuation is, is critical. The vast majority of what we have been spending our time on the last three, four months has been on relative valuation as opposed to absolute. 
this is a time when at least our view is, is that the industry uh, needs to consolidate. It needs to find a way to bring more uh, in a single vehicle to the customer. And so spending a lot of our time doing is, is working with our peers in a way that frankly was probably unheard of maybe 12 months ago. But if we have an investment, say in 10 different portfolio companies, what might we do on a combined basis that can provide better value to our customers? And so those conversations really allow us to avoid crystallizing the value today, but thinking about maybe participating in value creation together going forward. So, you know, how do you then value something on a relative basis? Well, we frankly look at all the different metrics one might look at, revenue contribution, asset contribution, what technology does somebody have? Frankly, what, what synergies, both revenue and cost, might we be able to achieve together if we brought our businesses, uh, you know, into a, a, a single vehicle? That is the tenor of the conversation that, that we have been having here recently. Um, and I'd say as we get further into the downturn and looking forward maybe into 2021, making new platform type investments, a lot of the underwriting for us is really around equity free cash flow yield. Can your business generate free cash flow? Uh, we aren't going to be valuing businesses, say, with the same sort of growth mindset that we might have had four, five, six, seven years ago when the industry was capacity beginning mode. But really on a steady state basis, what is the yield that an investor can get off of the free cash flow generated by a business in a market that is probably going to be not only a little bit structurally smaller, but perhaps a bit more stable and less is going to be asked of it from a growth perspective. Thanks, Patrick. Robert, again, maybe I'll come back to you and would love to get your perspectives on, on sort of valuation today. Yeah, I, again, would agree with what Patrick just said. You know, from our perspective, we are seeing a lot of um, interest um, uh, from, from, again, peers in the industry uh, around the theme of consolidation, um, uh, exchanging paper and, and joining forces, um, as Patrick just laid out, you know, stripping out synergies, um, you know, easy ones on the cost side and trying to be creative and thoughtful about where, uh, you know, top line synergies may exist. Um, and, and, you know, listen, I, I mean, if you, if you just go look at the, you know, the, um, the space from a public equity perspective in OFS, it's, it's again, amazing to see, um, you know, the range of enterprise values today for, for names that we're all familiar with that, you know, a year ago were, uh, you know, 10 times the, the size in terms of market cap that they are today. Um, and so, Everybody it feels like everybody is subscale today, and and really everybody in OFS. And so I think, um, you know, there there's lots of interest. It, it, it seems to me uh, in consolidation. And again, to compare this uh, to the kind of last pretty brutal downturn back in 2015 and 16, uh, you know, a lot of people talked about consolidation back then, um, and it felt like it was necessary. It probably was necessary, but it really didn't come to fruition on the scale that it feels like it's going to um, this time. And obviously this, this week alone, there've been a couple big announcements on the EMP side um, with, you know, Conoco and, and Concho and others. Um, and I, and I, I believe that's just going to continue to, um, to play out here uh, amongst OFS uh, competitors. Maybe, maybe switching to the, to the next question. Um, you know, look, there's, there's been a lot of volatility and changing sentiments toward the OFS sector over the past couple of years, um, which has severely impacted what I'd call the historical paths for monetizing, you know, investments in the space. What's your take on, on how significant historical investments in OFS, OFS will be realized, including timing and steps industry players are now taking to return invested capital? Patrick, if, if I could get your view on that, would appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Um, this is obviously a, a very relevant question for the non-permanent uh, shareholders amongst us here today. I think for a permanent company, it means a very different thing. But for somebody who's made an illiquid investment looking for a return at some time over the next two, three, four years, um, it's, a, it's a very pertinent question. We're likely to see uh, capital formation on the private side as a buyer universe take a long time. I think the industry is going to have to demonstrate it can produce returns. The public capital markets are likely to come back first. They're likely to be the first source, uh, at least in the United States, for a domestic buyer universe is likely to be those public markets. I think Robert said it very well. A lot of the public uh, OFS landscape is subscale today. We need it to become relevant for a large institutional investor base like Fidelity or Wellington or some of the other large investors. So that means market caps that are significantly larger than they are today. And so it, 
some point, provided that you know a target has a good clean balance sheet and is offering something that's differentiated, we would expect the public universe of companies to be thinking about consolidating largely using their own paper and probably jealously guarding whatever uh, cash they have on their balance sheet, but really using their paper to do to enact that consolidation and be the logical buyer. That means that there's a, a pretty interesting opportunity for for private investors, particularly institutional private investors, to think about how they might then, after that transaction, help create value as a sort of member of the team of a public company. And there's a lot of work I think the industry could do to consolidate where some investor like that could be helpful. The other and probably the more interesting buyer universe that we're seeing emerging is a growing subset of internationally sovereign backed buyers. This is probably from their perspective, if I was to kind of try to step into their thinking, uh, is a generational opportunity to really access North American and US and Canadian technology at rock bottom prices. Many of these potential buyers are incredibly well capitalized, have a compelling need to import new technology to help produce what is fundamentally good rock in international locations, but really a community. That is for the emerging buyer that I think we're gonna hear more about. You know, look, one of, one of Patrick's answers uh, sort of brings to mind a question you know, look, the, the ability to pick up assets at, at sort of rock bottom prices, uh, both good technology and good companies, uh, t to me does present an interesting opportunity for, for folks in the space. And, and I guess the question it would bring to mind is, do, do you think there's sufficient debt and equity capital available in the sector? Um, you know, what sort of the costs and, and, and returns associated with that capital and, and why do you think that or, or why not? Bobby is sort of the resident debt expert. Maybe I'll, I'll ask you for your input first. Yeah, so I think there's, there's two parts um, to that question. One is the industry as it is today. And then two uh, is really the potential consolidation that we might see uh, over the next uh, year or two. I would say the short answer is no. Uh, there is most certainly uh, not enough debt or equity capital to address the needs of the industry, particularly for the U.S. onshore industry, uh, both in the immediate term and presumably the long term. I would say for the existing businesses, companies that are out today operating as, as, as an independent company, uh, there are a couple of reasons that I, that I touched on as to why there is not uh, enough. And one is, most importantly, I would say equipment. Uh, companies, uh, as drilling activity, as production activity continues to increase, uh, they need new equipment to, to meet certain demands. Stuff gets worn out in the field. Uh, and then also, as, uh, as that activity also increases, companies' uh, ability to pull out equipment that is, uh, that is stacked out in the field is somewhat limited. Uh, and that happens with the best companies, because understandably, in a downturn, companies have to stack equipment. There's an inherent cost associated with it, and they're trying to be most efficient, uh, certainly with their capital. So there's, that's going to be a key area of concern as we start to see rate count particularly start to creep up uh, above 350 to um, 400. Uh, I would say two uh, is really uh, arguably the, uh, the most important when we think about long-term uh, prospects for oil field service companies, and that is companies' ability to execute uh, on organic growth, strategic initiatives, certainly internally. As with any recovery, uh, the co most companies are not generating enough free cash flow to be able to, to certainly to fund that. And that is certainly uh, a big area um, uh, uh, of concern. On the M&A side, uh, that is going to be a, a big area of concern, which raises the issue of how debt on balance sheets uh, certainly uh, are gonna be restructured and how do you replenish uh, the debt that is either uh, presumably restructured, equitized and or rolled over um, into uh, uh, any new entity. We all know that, uh, that that debt is short, a lot of companies levered up too much and this certainly leads to the valuation dislocation. Inevitably, when you have those conversations, you have to have an honest conversation about how the business finance itself, a combined entity in terms of working capital, and then certainly some of the other items that I missed equipment. So even if we were to take a lot of the mid size and then somewhat of the mid to lower tier private companies that are there, all for all the items that I mentioned, there's just not enough capital to be able to do it. And it's gonna require um, either uh, a contraction or some other new players to potentially come into the market or for others that would traditionally not step up 
certainly to step up. Great, Patrick, maybe I'll, I'll serve that one over to you to get your perspectives as well. Yeah, I think Bobby answered it well. Maybe I'll just add one, a little bit more global perspective. To answer your question, I think the first we get asked is what level of production. So is there enough capital today for the oil field services industry to support 13 million barrels a day of U.S. production? Certainly not. Is there enough for it to support 7 million barrels? That's probably arguable. It might be below where we are today. Um, and the problem, of course, is that it's it's not a quick you know, turn on on and turning off. The market has clearly told us that it needs less equipment in the space. And the pain that I think we're all going through of trying to figure out how do you allocate those assets and how do you allocate those scarce dollars of capital to support the customer producing that barrel of oil or that MCF of gas. It's just a, you know, a massive reshuffling exercise. If we fast forward, my guess is that we are likely going to need to have to ration a lot of that, uh, a lot of that asset base before the price signal comes back to say, okay, now the market is telling us we need to put new dollars in it. It's a very academic way to answer your question. There's a lot of pain that happens in the field as a result of getting from one point to the other point, but I think that's what we're seeing right now. Makes sense. And look, maybe I'll, I'll flip the question to sort of a consumer of capital. Robert, maybe you could provide your perspectives as you're trying to s sort of think through financing of your business and capital needs on a go-forward basis. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, again, would reiterate that, you know, there, I guess there, there is not enough capital in, in space to support, you know, again, I go back to my, my, my comment about having a difficult time renewing a working capital line of credit. Um, so no question, capital seems scarce. You know, I guess I would um, hopefully not directly repeat what Patrick just said, but put a different twist on it, which is, you know, if you're a contrarian here, there, there is a, the market is telling us something here, which is that, uh, and, and, and Patrick nailed it, we, we don't need 13 million barrels a day of oil coming out of, out of U.S. land. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously COVID driven, uh, the demand destruction related to COVID uh, has, has just made that situation much, much worse. Uh, so uh, the reality is, you know, capital is not available, but that, that may just mean that, you know, unfortunately as an industry, we, we don't need that much capital to support uh, the production that may be required to come out of the U.S. to, to balance supply and demand globally. So. Um, it, you know, we are, we are likely to go through, you know, a significant amount more pain uh, before that market balances. Hopefully, you know, uh, demand begins to or continues to recover throughout uh, the end of this year and, and, and hopefully the second half of, or excuse me, first half of uh, 21. Um, but, you know, from, from things I'm reading, you know, we may, be, we may not be back to 100 million barrels a day of, of uh, global demand, which means, you know, there's no question the U.S., cannot be producing, you know, 13, 14 million barrels a day either. So um, again, long way of saying it feels as, as a consumer of that capital, as an industry participant, it feels uh, painful, feels like there isn't enough capital, but there's probably a, I think the market's telling us there may be a good reason for that. Look, Joe, we, we haven't heard from you yet. So, so maybe I'll turn it over to you to talk through uh, some of the structural uh, challenges facing, facing OSS today. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and it, it, those are some good answers to the prior questions, and they overlap here a bit. Uh, obviously, 2020 itself has accelerated and modified a lot of things in our lives. Um, but prior to that, you know, as we all know, we had a, a low price environment and we had uh, decreased uh, demand for oil and gas and other, other items. Um, that occurred even and was exacerbated more in 2020, but it was it was going in that direction anyway prior to that. So what I'm curious about is changes that you're seeing with upstream customers uh, that they're making in their operations and how that will impact oil field services. Uh, and so I'll start with you, Patrick. Yes, maybe it might be helpful to put it in context, compare it to the most, you know, to the last downturn, call it end of 2014, early 2015. It feels across the portfolio and the touch points we have that pricing pressure was certainly immediate this downturn uh, on a per service and per product offered type basis, but a little bit less acute than it was in 2015. Uh, it felt like there was a little bit more fat to, to be cut through, I think, on just sheer pricing. And this time around, it has been uh, something where the producers are coming to our companies and asking not only for price concessions, but 
more of a, hey, show me what's new, show me how we can make this process better. There's something we have to do across the full value chain to lower the cost to deliver that product or that service. So in an environment where if you can navigate the COVID challenges of getting in to see the customer, which are not low, it's still actually a, a first challenge. If you can get in to see the customer, there does seem to be a genuine willingness to entertain broader solutions that are more systemic in how services and products are delivered today. And frankly, I think that's what the market's been telling us. It needs to focus less on services, but really focus on how can we reduce the total cost of the value chain. And so those are complex problems. It takes a while to work through. Um, uh, it, it doesn't help if you have a, a market that is still so flooded with assets that there's still some irrational pricing that is out there. Uh, but the, the general sort of optimistic view we might have if we look into 2021 is that those conversations that perhaps weren't able to be had in 2015, 2016 are certainly happening now, and they're a little bit more collaborative in nature. So we're hopeful that we can come out of this downturn with a greater use of automation, automation greater use of remote monitoring, and other ways to attack the problem than surely taking it on the chin from a per service or per product pricing. Thanks, Patrick. That that's very good, uh, Wayne. We haven't heard from you yet, so we want to get you involved. Would you be able to to help us uh, and give us some insight on on that question? Yes, Joe, and and thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I do think we're in a uh, <clears throat> a lower for longer type price environment, and that's the way we look at things uh, in our company. Uh, we really don't see anything driving the, uh, the price of the product, uh, you know, WTI 40 to 45 bucks. We're getting a little help in, uh, in natural gas, but really it's all about uh, being able to operate uh, under those conditions, uh, particularly with the, uh, the demand destruction that's taken place. You know, efficiency, uh, Patrick mentioned uh, automation, uh, utilization of technology uh, to uh, make the experience different for our customers uh, are important. Um, I think the big part of that is, is really the, uh, the business model. And while the business is a bit broken right now, the business model is a bit broken. Uh, on my completions uh, side of the business, uh, we're expected to, uh, to react, which we like that. We're a service business and have crews available 24 seven to perform uh, completion activities at the well site. When in fact, many of our customers uh, do not have visibility on what their activity is gonna look like uh, from month to month, much less quarter to quarter. At the end of the day, um, we're hopeful that we can see uh, the business model evolve. Um, you know, in my 39 years in the OFS sector, and we start looking at completion and wireline activities, the business model has very rarely changed. Over time, we've had uh, alliances and partnerships uh, with the ENP companies, and 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 those things have worked to various degrees. But the cycles in the business have dictated our actions, and and many times within the service sector and the ENP sector, those um, those interactions are very adversarial based upon what the rig count is, what the product price is, etc. Uh, 20 years ago, in, in my previous life in Schlumberger, uh, we were very innovative in, in business models that have kind of gone by the wayside. And, and, and those were around, around making a, uh, uh, a nice return uh, for the products and services that you provide with an opportunity to earn some incentives based upon project performance. And I really think that in a smaller market, with less players, not only on the EMP side, but also in the service sector, we're gonna to have to get back to those type of discussions, whereas we can better plan the, uh, the activity and, and, and be there uh, as responsive as we can. In a low price environment, it's all gonna be about efficiency, the utilization of those assets, and uh, ensuring that uh, we do all we can to uh, create the environment uh, for the EMP players uh, to make their profits in a, um, in let's say a limited uh, commodity uh, price market. Well, th thanks Wayne, that was very good. Um, Thomas as well, uh, would, you, uh, would you have anything to add on this, on this question? We'd like to get your thoughts. 
Sure. Um, so thank, thank you again for having me. So taking a step back, I would say operator service company relationships have been changing even, even prior to this downturn. So back in 2013, 14, when oil prices were 100, uh, you know, from an operator's perspective, the revenue side of the margin equation was so high that there were a lot of inefficiencies and bad practices in the space. But ever since that downturn in 15 and 16, there has been that focus on reduction in costs. And I think what, what COVID has done is even, you know, strengthened that quite a, quite a lot more. Uh, so you know, some of the changes that we've seen is uh, operators going to the service companies and really categorizing, okay, what are the services that I'm really uh, paying for, figuring out what can I eliminate, and all of that uh, went into cost transparency, supply chain optimization. So that ended up, uh, from an operational standpoint, you know, sourcing your own sand, uh, sourcing your own chemicals, um, even fuel, bringing your own fuel, fuel costs. So there's a lot of changes uh, that, that we've already seen. And looking ahead, I'd, I'd echo uh, what, what my fellow panelists have said with respect to automation, how that could be a way in which you, you decrease costs. Um, there's even this relentless focus on figuring out one, one good example is even the amount of chemicals that you're using in your frag design. So what we've seen is the concentrations have actually gone down quite a lot in an effort to cut costs. So I would say, I think there's still room to grow when, when it comes to figuring out more efficiencies and all of that. But a lot of the, a uh, lot of that, the wheels have been sort of set into motion way, you know, in the past too. So I think, I think we'll keep on that path. Thanks, Thomas. And that's a good segue into, into the next question I had. Obviously, you know, the, this year's decrease in activity has been unprecedented, but uh, it, it even seems more so compared to the, the historical shocks that we've had. Uh, and, we, you know, there certainly is a good case to be made that if 2020 uh, it, it would, would leave lasting impacts on the industry, and we touched on this a little bit earlier in some previous questions, uh, but when you when you consider oversupply of equipment, workforce reductions, and divestitures, how do you view the structural changes of uh, OFS is facing? Uh, Wayne, you're out there in the field and, and wanted to get your thoughts on that question as well. Yeah, Joe. Um, you know, I, I do think we need some additional structure structural changes in the business. And you know, I'm gonna say some things here that may not be too popular, but uh, obviously, not all are gonna survive uh, moving forward in a in a uh, in a smaller market with uh, less opportunities. And and of course, we we don't know how that's defined yet. Uh, you know, and in, in low barrier to entry uh, uh, services and and products markets, and you could say that U.S. land is that. Uh, there's really too much easy easy money floating around to allow all sorts of entrants uh, into the uh, playing field. And uh, that, along with undisciplined behavior, has, has, uh, has really caused quite a conundrum in the business, uh, independent of the, uh, of the demand destruction and activity levels, uh, lower activity levels we've seen. So I think uh, the structural changes, and I certainly don't understand uh, or, or, or claim to understand bankruptcy laws and so forth, but um, we need to get back to, uh, you know, as an industry, we hadn't done a very good job of returning the cost of capital. So one of the things we're focused on is, is really capital di discipline, return on capital employed, uh, the free cash flow generation, and, and creating value for our shareholders and stakeholders. And I think if we all, uh, stay true to that, uh, it will be the survival of the fittest. And that will uh, uh, not only bring investment back into this sector, but allow us all to have the right discussions between EMP and service company to get to where we, we need to go. And of course, our, our, our goal is doing more with less. We're going to have to do that. I'll talk about that uh, here in a little while. But it, it's all about that innovation. It's all about that connectivity with the customer and being able to uh, adapt and modify with uh, uh, just-in-time, fit-for-purpose solutions. That's what we're focused on, and that's making us more and more successful every day. Uh, and that one of those catalysts, I think, is, is consolidation, which we touched on earlier. 
uh, and there's a few questions that we have uh, that we just wanted to talk to the panel about. Uh, and how is the actual pace of consolidation impacting structural changes, either to the positive or negative? Um, and I'll, I'll read the, the other question as well is, does continued progress on balance sheet restructurings help with consolidation? And which catalysts would accelerate consolidation? Um, and so you can answer them in any order, but I'll start with you, Bobby, and see if, uh, if you have insight on that. Yeah, I would say uh, over the past six or nine months or ever since COVID started to wreak havoc on the industry, everyone's been talking about consolidation in the oil field services industry. And there's been a lot of fancy words thrown around, smash codes, divestitures and the like. And a lot of people are surprised at the pace of consolidation right now, uh, particularly given what's happened uh, over the last month or so with a lot of the EMP um, companies announcing transformative uh, mergers. Um, I, would, I would say this is that we all have to remind ourselves that uh, there are really two things about consolidation in OFS. One is uh, it is very hard, even separate from the debt issue, to negotiate, execute, and integrate an oil field service merger. It's just a hard thing to do. You're not merging uh, fields and, and some field personnel. It's it's typically businesses with multiple assets across multiple service lines with multiple social issues. And it's just hard to do in a normal environment. The biggest impediment so far has obviously been, which we've touched upon has been the valuation issue. And then most importantly, the debt issue. If we are able as an industry to get around this debt issue, I do think, uh, unfortunately it will be painful. There will be some healthy consolidation. There are a lot of companies that simply uh, really uh, certainly um, should be operating right now. And I think you're going to see more of that. I don't think you're going to even see it on the scale, which most people uh, are certainly predicting, but I think you're exactly right. Uh, I think it's, if we're able to resolve this balance sheet issue and the, and parties are able to be realistic on valuation, uh, then I think you're going to see some healthy things happen over certainly the next 12 months, but that's certainly a big if. We didn't see it in 17 and 18. Maybe we'll see it in uh, in 21 and 22, but who knows? Thanks, Bobby. Uh, Wayne, back to you. Have you uh, what have you seen on the consolidation front? You kind of touched on it a little bit in your last answer. Yeah, you know the the big moves by the large EMP companies uh, that have taken place in the last couple of weeks are good. Uh, it's it's necessary. Uh, I, I, however, have been a bit disappointed in the lack of uh, movement on the services side. We saw Liberty, Schlumberger, and a few other things, but uh, there's too many players out in the business. And I think the big challenge, and it was mentioned before, is just a lack of capital to make things happen, number one. And number two, the maybe unrealistic expectations of value of your particular company. So, um, you know, I, I think that more has to happen. Um, and, uh, but who's going to be the first mover to do it? And, and with those constraints, it makes it very difficult. I mean, you could be sitting with a, with a stellar balance sheet and, uh, continue to operate and execute and, and, and head down the road without those kind of opportunities uh, presenting themselves and then getting them to the finish line is very difficult. And as an individual that's, uh, that's brought many companies together in the past. I, I, I also, I think Bobby mentioned it, but it's very difficult, uh, particularly in this environment from an integration perspective uh, to bring all that together. It's not impossible by any means, but that is the key to adding value is, uh, is finding that uh, opportunity that fits culturally well with, with your company, uh, which is a big step forward in, in trying to bring uh, companies together. I mean, we're looking at, personally, we're looking at opportunities, what we say around the wellhead that can add value to the services, the products and services that we already provide. That makes it easier because it makes the, the synergies and the combinations easier, but certainly uh, it's not easy. Uh, we'd like to see some additional consolidation. Maybe we're one of the companies that needs to, needs to uh, move forward to do that, but, um, uh, we'll see, but I, I think it will happen. And with the EMPs taking the lead, 
the service uh, business will be right behind uh, making some things happen, I hope. Great, thanks, Wayne. Um, Paul, I think uh, I'll turn the last question on structural change questions over to you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And, and look, uh, you know, a couple of the answers uh, that were just given, you know, you know, prompt a question in my head. And, and look, I'll, I'll sort of give the preamble. One of the things that's always excited me about the, the oil field service and just energy over energy industry overall is just the innovation and the reputation of innovation and resourcefulness that the, the, this industry has shown time and time again to really adapt to changes like we're seeing now and basically the customer needs that come out of those changes. So given the wide scale structural changes that are unfolding, you know, what, what product, what productivity initiatives are, are, are you seeing industry participants pursue? You, you know, for example, you know, a lot of people talk about technology. Robert talked about it a minute ago, you know, sort of reams and reams of data that's available. You know, what technologies are, are folks seeing being used to enhance, you know, operating efficiencies, profitability and customer solutions, as well as service overall in the industry? And, and Patrick, maybe I'll, 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 I'll I'd like to get your view on that one, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, it's a very dynamic industry. It's kind of bred out of the level of competition we have and um, the number of different going um, two, two big ones that we talked about before, maybe I'll touch on those two first, is the sort of pairing of remote monitoring and automation. So remote monitoring, frankly, it's nothing more than just providing the customer with situational awareness. They don't need to send somebody out to go look at something if they've got a very ubiquitous off the shelf way to know what it is from miles away. Um, that would seem to be a very low hanging uh, piece of fruit that we need to pick across the entire value chain. Most notably in the production side, there seems to be a real um, opportunity to do that. And frankly, there have been, uh, that's been happening in fits and starts, but the industry is ripe to do that in a very big way. Automation really comes down to just de you know, taking people off of the very rote tasks, particularly if it puts that human operator in harm's way. You know, tasks that are around production seem most right because they're the most repetitive, but we are also seeing that some of our companies creep into the completion side where we can remove a person from harm's way away from the pressure containing components and automate some procedures, uh, particularly when coupled with this personal awareness. So those are some process improvement things that we can do, I think, with readily available technology that, frankly, many other industries have adopted years ago. Two other areas that I might touch on, though, is material science and sort of mechanical improvements. We are seeing with some of the equipment that our companies are producing is some step changes in the use of different types of material science uh, with pieces of equipment that are just longer lasting or more purpose built to whatever task they're being assigned. It's something that could be uh, a tool that goes down or something that's on the surface that just frankly has a much longer useful life. On the mechanical side, that's just the bread and butter. Think of oil field services. They're incremental improvements to tools, to equipment. It just make it more purpose built. It's those sort of small little pieces that'll improve the efficiency of the human operator. That it can continue. The final area that I'd probably touch on is the one that's the most difficult and that is kind of holistic changes to behavior. And that's one that requires coordination between customer and vendor. So how do you electrify, for example, all of your ESPs in a given field? There might be a much more effective way to do that and a much more efficient way to do that than simply renting single-use diesel generators, uh, you know, one at a time from 16 different vendors. Maybe there's a way with some forward thinking to adopt a program where you're using a lot of the waste gas to produce that electricity on a field-wide basis where you can really reap synergies if it's a large enough customer that's thinking multi-year ahead. But that sort of level of innovation, I think, has got to be two-way. It's got to come from both sides because it is something that requires coordination between customer and vendor. So anyway, those are a couple that we are seeing. Hopefully that's uh, good food for thought. But uh, you know, I'm just wildly optimistic that when the price, commodity price comes down, we do see a lot of innovation come out. I think that we'll be surprised one, two years from now, the way the industry is going to be really shifted in the way it operates. I agree with you. My, my experience in the industry overall is, is tough times actually uh, help the industry move forward with leaps and bounds when, when things sort of normalize. You know, Wayne, would, would love to get your perspective on this as well, how you're implementing technology and other things that sort of optimize, uh, you know, GNR's operations. 
Yes, and, and it's all about that and, and the utilization of technology to enhance our operational efficiencies, uh, customer solutions, service, and, and hence our profitability. What, what we're looking at is re-engineering the experience at the well site. Uh, when we started our wireline uh, business and our uh, water management business uh, a few years ago, it was all about uh, uh, remote monitoring and control, and, and which conveys just-in-time technical support and so forth. Well, we're taking that to a new level with, with uh, all our units uh, uh, online 24-7. Uh, uh, we uh, put together an integrated well site platform, which not only eliminates some people uh, at the well site, but also gives the company person a, uh, an iPad to monitor um, all the operations simultaneously going on at the well site when you talk about pump, pump down perforating uh, type opportunities. So uh, we're very excited about uh, where this will go. I mean, we had the COVID uh, unfortunately hit our country and, and yet um, we were very well prepared to address that uh, with these remote uh, operations uh, to provide the customer with real time KPIs, operational stats on performance and, and then eliminate uh, literally some folks at the well site. So I think it's gonna take more of that. Um, we're, we're in a unique position ourselves to be able to develop products based upon feedback from our service organizations. So uh, that real time uh, movement uh, to modify what we do in line with the customer's objectives is really starting to pay some uh, some dividends with this integrated uh, platform at the well site. So uh, I think it's all about productivity, doing more with less, and uh, and and we're excited. I mean, it's even going to come down to 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 possibly not having a uh, uh, a wireline unit at the well site, some other delivery system out on these pads that can be moved from pad to pad, well to well. Uh, uh, that it's used to convey products in and out of the well, uh, that, that's even gonna change. And I'm excited about some of the developments uh, coming out in the future uh, in that area. Uh, look, I, I think that that's a nice segue into, you know, to me, one of the, the big things that's particularly emerged over the past couple of years um, that's forcing people to think about energy or traditional energy uh, differently. And, and obviously for helping folks within the industry sort of modify operations and that's that's the whole ESG dynamic you know Joe maybe I'll turn it back over to you to to get the panelists perspective on you know sort of ESG in the industry and where they think it's going thanks Paul and you hit it on the head I mean the movement has become increasingly stronger uh, over the years as far as ESG and renewables we're seeing things uh, as everybody knows on this call for uh, uh, whether it's new new funds that are being started up for renewables that you're hearing about, a lot more uh, certainly groundswell uh, relating to environmental concerns associated with uh, uh, just generally oil and gas. The word energy has become a little bit more taboo as the years have gone on. As as I know, everybody on this call has 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 heard. Uh, but the real question I wanted to ask was whether you folks think the industry is adapting to these ideologies in both a practical and productive way. Um, and Patrick, I'll, I'll start with you to get your thoughts. Yeah, so at least from my perspective, the ESG movement is real. We all need to acknowledge that. I think it's here to stay. Um, and I think it's up to us, each of us and, and all of our companies to decide um, how do we want to respond to it. Uh, for better or for worse, ESG can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I think step one is simply defining what does it mean to you. Uh, embrace it, define what it means to you. Um, it does remind me a little bit of the calls for increased safety in our industry, call it 10 years ago, and some of the resistance that we might have had to it. Uh, frankly, it, it forces a lot of us to sit here and ask ourselves, if you think about the E, the S, and the G, you know, the first question on E is, do we all want to be good stewards of our, of our environment? I don't know a single CEO or employee of any of our companies that doesn't want to do that. Um, it's not a controversial thing. I think a lot of it's about demonstrating how do you go about doing that. Frankly, that can be a business opportunity for your customer if you can define how you're doing it in a way that is a better custodian of the environment. The second question on the S part, it's 
we all want to be good employ uh, employers to um, you know our employees. We want to be that employer of choice. We want all of our our, our folks to to go home. And the G part, frankly, I think this is the really the big message for our industry is really around G more than it is around E. Have we been good stewards of capital? I think there's a lot of ground we can make up in the investor community if we focus on the G part of ESG as well. So as I, I think about it, you know, the E and the S and the G appropriately defined and appropriately embraced can be a real source of strength for our industry. We need, just need to get past the mental block and think it only means uh, that we all have to invest in one form of energy over another. What we provide is something the world is desperately going to need for uh, the foreseeable future. And I think a lot of this is just about embracing this movement and telling our story in a way that is accessible uh, to the investor community. That's that was very insightful, Patrick. Thank you, um, Robert. Did you have any thoughts on that question as well? From a yeah, yeah, that was uh, Patrick. Really well said. I think um, I think you, you you hit the nail on the head. I think for the way we're thinking about it is first defining what it means to us. Uh, the second step for us actually is just, you know what, we need to start actively tracking those metrics, which we already know we're doing. And, and again, across the E, the S and the G, uh, you know, in our case, um, there's plenty that we can already, um, you know, begin tracking if we, if we put our minds to it. And frankly, we just don't track because it's been a normal course of, work, you know, historically. So, um, and so I agree, I think there is an opportunity for the industry and for companies in particular to um, take advantage of, uh, uh, you know, ad adhering to or, or, or beginning to structure, I should say, their own ESG practices. Um, because I do think it is becoming, even for a private company like ourselves, it's becoming more relevant, um, not just from an investor perspective, but our clients are also starting to focus on it more. And, and again, Patrick nailed this one, that it is very similar in my mind to, to safety 10 or 20 years ago. Um, you know, we believe that many of our clients, you know, a couple of years from now or maybe sooner may ask us for our state safety stats and some ESG stats as well before we go on the rig site. And so we, we embrace that. We're, we're, um, uh, you know, I, we're, we're still admittedly somewhat in the early days of, of, of chasing down the right way to, again, structure and track these metrics, but, but uh, we're, we're embracing it and, and excited about it. Thanks, Robert. So uh, the next question, Wayne, I wanted to, to gear relating to ESG on the uh, OFS impact and thought you'd be a good person to respond to this one. So, um, thinking about whatever material impact ESG has had on operating practices of both OFS and the broader energy industry and the ultimate long-term impact ESG will have on both OFS and energy as a whole, can ESG ideologies somehow complement the OFS sector given the continued need for fossil fuel as an energy source? Why or why not? And if they can complement each other, how so? Yes, absolutely. And, and just to step back on the previous question a bit, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, this movement with ESG. And, you know, we're in, a, we're in an industry that, that learns to adapt uh, very quickly. Uh, I'm happy to see a common language, uh, a common scorecard that's out there. And when you look at ESG and, and, and you look at the different components of it, much of which as an industry we've been addressing for many years, but maybe have been somewhat quiet about it. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, safety stats are up there when you're, you're bidding for a contract or you have to ensure that, that your company is eligible to participate at a well site, you, you have to have certain metrics. But ESG, is, uh, it's been around forever. We're finally just quantifying uh, the efforts in a language that we can all uh, you know, equate to. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. As far as the, the impact on the operating practices, I mean, it's affecting us in everything we do. I mean, we're looking at changing our, uh, our wireline units from diesel to electric. Some of that's going on. We've implemented what's called an eco line, which is a wire line that doesn't require a grease injection, uh, grease being a, uh, uh, a substance we want to get away from. Obviously, the remote, remote monitoring uh, part of the business is important. And, and even so much as 
who you have uh, at the well site and the footprint versus equipment that's idling there forever. So I, I think we're reacting. And, and one of the best examples of that, uh, uh, Joe, and I may be moving out a little bit, is, is the whole entire COVID response of the industry. We operate in every basin in the U.S. And, and I was amazed at uh, not only from an EMP perspective, but an OFS perspective across the spectrum, how our industry responded just in time to the COVID response and, and being involved in the community to ensure that we did all we could to minimize that exposure. So, you know, solutions to maximize social distancing, uh, uh, consistent operating standards out there, minimize uh, people and best practices at the well site. So we're already seeing some of that work uh, in a common language, and, and I'm happy to see that, and I only see it getting more and more prevalent and, and being a part of our everyday lives. It's well said, Wayne, and, and I agree with you on the, you know, being a, an essential service when this whole COVID started, uh, you, a lot of folks out in the field were the test case for, for the proper protocols to use, and so that, that's good to hear, and I think they did a very good job on that, too. So I hope you guys have your crystal balls out because these are the type of questions for that. Um, but we've already, we've already talked about the various dynamics that are going on in the previous questions as far as items that are making the outlook of the industry uncertain. And so, uh, Patrick, I was going to start with you on this question, which is, there's a few of them in here, but what is your long-term industry outlook? Um, in a subset of that, we'll talk about the timing and velocity of recovery, commodity price outlook, rig count, as well as what peak recovery looks like. And when you answer, it would be great if you could specify what you're basing these numbers on um, outside of the crystal ball that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> well, Joe, that presumes that we're going to offer you some specific numbers uh, in an answer here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, this, I think it's impossible to even address that question without acknowledging that this is all about demand, right? And predicting the course of COVID is probably uh, incrementally more difficult than predicting the price of oil. So now we have sort of a, a twofer here. If we can predict both of those, I think we'll, we'll be uh, true. Uh, we'll have true crystal balls, but yeah. So on the backdrop of everything here is we've clearly seen a tremendous amount of demand destruction. And while it's been heartening to see it come back, getting to prior to, you know, 2019 kind of highs, it's absolutely going to require some resolution to this, this pandemic. And I think anybody who suggests otherwise, I think it's probably not looking at the picture. It's not just enough to get transportation fuel back, but uh, jet fuel is a small, but a very critical part of that global mix. It's going to be a big driver of helping us get back to uh, prior levels of demand. If we want to push it out further, make the assumption that we do find a solution or a vaccine to where people can begin to operate. That's the question of what is the longer term sort of demand picture look like? Have, have human behaviors changed so much? I guess our view is that it, 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 while it has taken a step change down to likely continue sort of steady incremental growth as we think. It's going to take a couple of years to build a couple of years back that the world will likely surpass the most recent peak. It's just going to take likely until 2021 end of year or perhaps 2022 uh, first quarter. Um, what does that mean for the North American market? I think is a fundamentally different question. I think right now we are all somewhat beholden to um, our favorite cartel that's helping to keep the price where it is today. But a combination of continued compliance by the OPEC members uh, good cooperation between OPEC and Russia is pretty essential to us remaining range bound where we are. That's a lot of assumptions to think about the short term demand called over the next 18 months. But maybe to take a step back on a longer term basis, I don't think a transition away from uh, from oil and gas as a term transportation fuel is going to happen overnight. It, it's likely going to continue to be the base load fuel that we use, particularly given the voracious appetite of the de developing world. Um, will there be demand destruction as a result of other forms of energy? Absolutely. It's the natural evolution of every form of energy going back, you know, a millennia. But I think what that history has also shown us is that it doesn't happen very quickly when the amount of scale that's required to fuel a global economy is involved. So I'm hopeful that, you know, we, we are able to find a resolution to COVID and that we can 
resume whatever the new normal will look like there. I said it, the new normal, but that's, uh, we'll figure out what it means here in the next year. But once that's behind us, we will likely see a continued um, uh, growth in demand. It's just going to be a question about what role does the United States and does Canada play as shale swing suppliers. And I think there's a very, fairly good chance that uh, that role is likely going to require us to produce less than what peak oil was here in the United States, um, but that there's going to be an increasing call on shale services just as the decline curves begin to bite into that total amount of production. So a little bit of a mixed bag there. Uh, not a lot of specific numbers. Sorry, don't have a crystal ball, but maybe maybe Robert can enlighten us. I think he might have a better crystal ball than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that was a thoughtful response, and and that's why I said the crystal ball in the beginning is it's it's really hard to answer that at this point. But I agree on the COVID side, that's going to have to get resolved first before you can figure out where you're going forward. That's a a very very good point, um, Thomas. I wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that. Sure. So, I mean, obviously, this is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about, running scenarios and uh, how that does something, how that changes things. So I think um, I echo what Patrick said. I think uh, in near term, it's really dependent on oil prices, which, again, is tied to global demand. So our view is um, next year, we'd see demand at around 96 million barrels per day which is still going to be lower than where we were in 2019. So oil prices, what it means to oil prices would be you start off the year at around $40 per barrel, and then you exit around 50. So mid forties is what the average would be for 2021. So when we, one way to think about it, which we've started recently doing is, um, so when the downturn unfolded, we, we saw that the frac fleets were stacked faster than the rigs. So what that meant was there was a definite buildup of ducts and abnormal buildup of ducts. Uh, and since I think August, September, October, what we've seen is there's been more frac fleets that have been deployed and that drug, duck inventory is being now, it's, it's coming down to where we were pre-COVID. So one way to look at it is it's, it's not, it, it takes around, a rig can drill around 1.4 to 1.6 wells in a month, whereas a frack fleet can frack around 4 to 4.5 wells in a month. So it's much easier to draw down, but it's actually a little harder to build, build that back up. So that's one way to think about when would we need rig counts to get back up if we need to maintain US uh, onshore production, right? So our view is US 48, excluding Gulf of Mexico, we, we have, um, exit December 2020 to December 2021, we, we have 8.8 uh, .8 million barrels per day. So we'd see U.S. declining a little bit in the first half, and then uh, as budgets reset and activity picks back up in the first half of the year, that lagging effect comes shows up on the production side in the second half. So exit rates year, year over year, I think, would be very similar. So what, what does that mean for activity? Uh, we think um, drilling will probably increase 10 to 15 percent somewhere in, in that ballpark. Uh, year over year, 2021 versus 20. Uh, on the fracking side, a little bit better, uh, around 15 to 20%. Um, so obviously, um, still going to 2021 better than 2020, but still going to be around 30 to 40% lower than where we were in 2019. So that's our view on, on kind of the short term. So going beyond that, um, you know, we do see uh, demand, global demand for oil going above um, where we were in 2019, but you know the peak is going to be this decade. We will have peak oil demand, and what pro probably what COVID's done is that's it's accelerated that, and the peak is going to be lower than what, what it would have been if COVID hadn't been there. So we think that's going to be around 103, 104 million barrels per day. So our official view on oil prices beyond 2021 is going to be in the early 60s is where we have prices to be, but we do not see um, activity recovering back to 2019 levels in the next five years. Permian does, but most of the other place, we don't see that. Um, you know, I'll throw out some numbers so you guys can get some context on that. So rig count, we think would peak probably around 750 sometime in the next five years. So to give you some context, uh, we had around 820, 830 horizontal rigs in 2019. And uh, frack fleets, you know, we don't need as many frack fleets as we did. Uh, efficiency gains and all of that plays a huge role in that. So in the past, if we needed 300 to 350, we probably need around 250 to 300. 
So that's kind of our view on the market um, based on all of the assumptions. Great, Thomas. That's that, that was interesting to hear. Um, and thanks for the detail. Uh, now, that was really just talking more the market in general, but I'm going to turn it over to Paul. I think we wanted to focus in a little more detail on particular basins. Yeah, and, and, and look, Thomas, the, the, the previous answer was interesting and obviously threw a lot of facts out, which I think are going to make people sort of think and, and, and potentially recalibrate. But one of the things that has struck me you know, particularly over the past year or so, but I'd argue this trend started, you know, even coming out of 2014, you know, in my opinion, you've definitely seen the industry, you know, circle the wagons to focus not only on a particular basin, but also within a certain area in particular basin, i.e. the core of the core. In some circumstances, folks are predicting, predicting that particular basins, such as the Balkan, you know, never really recovered meaningfully. What's your view on the, the attractiveness of the various producing basins in the U.S.? And do you think sort of the level of attractiveness and, and state of the industry encourage historically domestic focused industry participants to potentially pursue international expansion more aggressively? Sure, I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, when you look at the U.S. law 48, um, you know, the major places are going to be the Permian, the Eagleford, the Bakken, the Midcon, the DJ, and obviously the gas place, which, which is going to be the Marcellus and, 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 the, and, and Haynesville. So when we look at the Permian, for sure, we are expecting the Permian to increase its market share uh, with respect to activity across the U.S. So that's definitely going to be here. So when people look at, okay, what are my assets that's going to give me the best ROIs? The Permian definitely has, uh, you know, ranks top top of the line uh, with respect to that regard. Eagleford, I, I think definitely activity is going to increase, but we, we will not see uh, activity get back to the levels that we've seen uh, before. Bakken, you're absolutely right. Even prior to this, it was running out of tier one acreage, so we we think probably the Bakken's best days are behind it. Midcon, again, even prior to this, we saw significant downsizing with respect to drilling and completion programs by operators. And what COVID's done is it's black players have just pulled out of the basin completely. So we don't see the Midcon playing any major uh, role in, in, in DNC activity in the US. So interesting thing about internationally. So when you think about you know shale or unconventional outside of the US. So you obviously start off with Canada and Canada has been a bloodbath this year. You have, it's, it's been worse off than even the US. And even next year, we, I talked to some of those folks up there and next year doesn't look as robust as well. Everything keeps getting pushed further and further out. Um, so 2021 isn't really shaping up to be any sort of recovery at best. It could be what we see in 2020. So Canada, not, not too bullish on that. Um, and then outside of that, then there's Argentina, the Wakamurta. So I've actually spent some time there, um, you know, a couple of years back. So there was a lot more optimism um, with respect to the Wakamurta. It has the potential uh, to be the next Permian from a geology perspective, but there's so many roadblocks when it comes to geopolitical issues and infrastructure issues that it's nowhere close to where it should be. So if the Wakamurta were in the US, you, you actually, it'd actually be one of the most attractive shale plays in, in the world. Um, so what we've seen is um, as soon as COVID hit, there has been very little activity. YPF, I, I don't think has done anything over the past three to four months. Um, we've seen Schlumberger actually deploy some of their assets from the basin to the Middle East. We are even hearing Baker may exit the space. So I think from an OFS perspective, there's, there's still, you know, Halliburton, and Calfrack and guys like that who still have a presence there. And I think they'll still have a presence there, but at a much reduced footprint. So again, very dependent on oil prices and, and it's very hard to figure out exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but recently over the past one, two, one and a half months, there's been a lot of chatter on the Middle East and even a little bit in China. So there's, there's one shale play in the Middle East that folks are looking at developing and that's the Jafura field. And as I said, Schlumberger deploying some assets there and 
be getting a lot more questions on that space tells me that there's this there's, there's some activity happening so definitely something that uh, you know OFS companies are looking at and I know other OFS companies have deployed some of their assets over there as well but overall when you look at the scale of operations US versus any other play outside the US there's no comparison it's 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 just minuscule so that's sort of a um, quick overview of um, all of that. Thanks, Thomas. That's interesting. I, I hadn't heard about China, so I'll, I'll need to look that up. But, um, you know, Joe, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to sort of take, take us home on, on some final questions and final thoughts from our panelists. I wanted to get to the last question, which is going back again from a little more specific to, to general. Um, and Bobby, I'll, I'll start with you on this question. Um, you know, the, the prediction of the gloom and doom has occurred for OFS many times before, as we all know. Uh, and so we, we thought it merited asking, are current sentiments overdone or are the best days for oil field services in the rear view mirror and why and why not? And so I think as with most things in the oil field services industry, the, uh, the death of the OF industry is massively overdone. Uh, for, for a host of reasons. And I think you have to look back at the last 40 years um, in the industry in the 70s when a lot of these service companies split off from EMP companies in the 80s with rate count collapsing to 06 and 07 when we were thinking we were at peak oil and had no idea that the shale boom was actually going to happen. What the OFS industry, uh, in my view, doesn't get credit of, it is remarkable at adapting. Uh, positioning uh, and taking it on the chin and plowing ahead. And so uh, I think oil companies are going to have to produce, they're going to have to drill. Uh, I think everyone on this panel has rightfully stated that oil and gas is not going away anytime soon. What we do know is, is that a lot of companies, and this is surprisingly, at least what I've seen uh, over the last 10 years, have very quietly tried to figure out ways to potentially capture uh, some uh, renewables business. And you certainly heard it in a lot of the majors uh, this, this past week in their earnings call mentioning digital renewables, how to position. That's just not the majors. That's also the mid tiers, it's the smaller uh, companies and uh, there's gonna be that gradual position. And I think this industry is very well positioned to transition over the next 10 to, to 20 years. So. Uh, ever the optimist, I, I do think that um, the industry is certainly going to have some hard times ahead. But uh, to say that it's all doom and gloom and that these businesses aren't going to adapt, obviously the capital has got to be there. Uh, the management teams, the most important asset, have got to be there, and people's willingness to invest. Uh, but I think these are. I think this is an, an industry that will certainly uh, transition well and it's not the end by any stretch of the imagination. That certainly wraps up the questions on my end. Paul, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, look guys, I, I thought this was a fascinating discussion today. And, and look, I wanna express sort of my sincerest thank you for, for both of your time and insights you, you know, on, on these questions. Some of which, you know, in my opinion, as Joe mentioned, are, are require a crystal ball and not, not necessarily easily answered. But in wrapping up, look, this concludes the oil field service sector and industry at a turning point, which is a Stevens Investment Banking webinar panel in collaboration with the law firm Lock Ward. Be sure to follow the rest of our virtual thought leadership series online and have a good day. Stevens, an independent financial services firm, has a long history in the energy markets and is highly regarded for its sector expertise and prudent client advice. Over the past decade, Stevens has continued to affirm its industry focus, growing its dedicated investment banking team to 15 professionals and completing 167 transactions to date. The group's coverage includes the exploration and production, master limited partnerships, oil field services sectors, and energy infrastructure. The combined knowledge of the energy team enables Stevens to provide clients an unmatched level of investment banking service, including mergers and acquisitions advisory, fairness opinions, and public and private debt and equity offerings. 
As one of the world's preeminent energy law firms, Lock Lord regularly represents major and independent oil and gas companies, pipeline and midstream companies, oil and gas service companies, power generation companies, refineries and petrochemical operations, and other energy-related interests, both domestically and internationally. The firm's lawyers serve as trusted advisors to clients from the most complex of transactions and disputes to day-to-day -day commercial and operational needs. Lock Lord was recently named the 2020 Energy and Industrial Law Firm of the Year by the Deal Middle Market Awards.